Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken. And I'm Keith Isles. And we are both independent filmmakers that enjoy talking about other directors' work. And uh, we're currently on our sort of first run of going through the A to Z of filmmakers or A to Z, if we ever have any uh, listeners in the US, which, uh, you know, to, to double our... Um, our viewers or our listeners, should I say? Uh, and and you know we're, we're doing a sort of mixed bag. It's it's filmmakers, past and present, and we're not being you know film snobs about it either. It's it's anything no. sort of from Attenborough to Zwick or uh, Argento to Zombie. <laughs> it's kind of and anything in between. Or as our our previous host said, Argento. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Yeah. Dario Argento. Yes, Argento. 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 <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Actually, yes, yes. Maybe I should get my own back on Mike and, and give him a bit of a ragging for once, as he usually uh, takes the piss out of me in my absence. You know. But we love him really, and a very yes. interesting podcast actually, because uh, the director that you t- familiar with, to be perfectly honest with you. So. Um, I found that a very interesting podcast from my perspective. Certainly, and that's why we do it, because we do get we get to look at uh, directors work that we may not be that familiar with. And certainly the director we're going to talk about tonight, um, I really didn't know this guy, but I had seen his work. I knew of his work. His films were always there at the video shop. I remember them being there. And yet I didn't know the guy. And he's British. Indeed. So, uh, Keith, who is our pick for the letter I? Right. Well, I mean, you know, with most of the letters we've had and many of them to come, uh, there's usually dozens upon dozens of choices uh, to go for. But um, when we got to I, yeah, it was quite hard to find any. I mean, um, there was uh, James Ivy. Uh, you know, was the other one that sort of sprang to mind. You know, sort of Merchant Ivy films, yes. and but but no, we've we've actually gone for John Irvin. John um, Irvin, yes, yes. Who you know, uh, director of such films as Hamburger Hill, Raw Deal, Next to Kin, Dogs uh, of War, Dogs of War, Free Fall, and uh, you know, a, a British filmmaker that I just wasn't that wear off but i'd seen his work yeah i mean i mean i i remember you know i knew i knew of the name uh because obviously as as we've covered in loads of podcasts always been interested in films and uh you know sort of during the 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 early 90s and whatever i i remember his name you know appearing in a lot of stuff that i was watching um the ones that I particularly remember, there was a, a film called Next of Kin, which starred Patrick Swayze and Liam Neeson. Uh, That's that he right, did. yeah. I remember seeing that. Um, I remember, you know, the the Robin Hood film. Um, yes, I remember you know, Robin with Hood his, film, yeah. The other Robin Hood film, you know. Uh, the the down and dirty Robin Hood film. Indeed, yeah. And, and you know, obviously the Dogs of War with, with Christopher Walken. Um, apparently he started off, his, his his career doing uh, well he did some documentaries uh and he also did some british uh television you know for like itv playhouse and whatever oh but yes but he's most famous for doing tinker taylor, taylor Soldier Soldier Spy. Spy. Spied, yeah. yeah which i must admit um that w- that was actually a little bit before my time so mm. i i hadn't I haven't seen that mini series. I know it's the one with Alec Guinness uh, That's right, yeah. in it, and and I did. To to be honest, when, when they when they sort of redone redid John Le Carre's, um, you know, that story with the film a few years back, the one starring Gary Oldman. I, I have to admit, even though it had some great actors in, and and you know, wasn't like a badly made film or anything, but I, I don't know whether I just watched it in the wrong mood or what. But I, I found it rather rather dull and boring so i didn't really um i didn't really sort of go back and watch any other yeah, stuff that film did did get uh, that complaint because i i remember going to see it at the cinema and i was i loved it i thought it was great but my friend who i went to see it with he came out and go god that was boring i'm like 
wow, yeah. did we just see the same film? Because I was, you know, well, I thought it was really good. But... I seem to remember I saw it with my girlfriend at the time um, on a on like a midnight showing, and I think uh, you, yeah. you know it's yeah. probably not the best time to watch no. a, a no. film like no. that. Um, I remember, you know, thinking it was really well performed by by everybody in it, but um, but no, but I, I mean to. to got off track slightly there um the, the 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 point the point is as by the way as mike tack did many times as well with his waffling on i'm gonna put in there but no um but, uh, I, I oh come seen... on is this just gonna be a rag <laughs> or no, mike tack no, not not at all not at all we love mike i wouldn't be working with him now if if, if i didn't <laughs> but um no I, I hadn't seen the um i'm just trying to get my own back on the other podcast uh, i hadn't, I hadn't <laughs> which which to listeners will be weird because obviously we we've, we've recorded one since then so i hadn't heard what he said about me while i was away <laughs> but there you go um but no, back onto John Irvin. Um, no, I hadn't seen Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, so I can't really comment um, on that. But as I mm. said, was very aware of his films uh, at the time. Um, I remember, in- interestingly enough, with the with the whole Robin Hood thing, um, it was you know it was one of those ones where it came out. It was made at the same time and came out at the same time as as the Kevin Costner. Um, Kevin Prince Reynolds, uh, yeah. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, yeah, which obviously, you, you know, sort of won that war and, and, and was a lot more entertaining. But what yeah. I didn't realise actually until I was doing a bit of research on John Irwin is um, that was actually a re- his version, Robin Hood, was actually made as a television movie for Fox, and oh, it okay. got because I, I remember I saw it on a Saturday morning screening right. prior to Costner's one coming out and okay. you know at the time I was reasonably entertained by it um it, it's kind of interesting these wars with with you know popular films that sort of get made at a certain time because because even though sort of Costner won that war uh you know years later when when two wire up films came out at the same time his one um, sort of lost, even though it was a very good film, sort of lost out to Tombstone, uh, with, you know, with Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer. And, yeah. and it was, you know, one of those other situations where two uh, were sort of released at the same time. But um, yeah. It's a very familiar pattern, isn't it, in Hollywood, that you, you get two films that come along at the same time. So you'll have like one summer, you'll get uh, two volcano films or yeah. you'll get two asteroid films. <laughs> and yes. I, I mean, it's. I I think I don't know if it's just a case of just timing or that when the scripts had gone round the studios, and instead of picking it up, when the studios thought, "Hmm, we could do with one of these stories," we won't buy this one. We'll just make our own one. I, I it's it's always a, a, a an interesting thing mm. that I find that they have um, like two types of films come out at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's all to do with trends, and I mean, I mean, you know, it's it's back to the old, uh, you know, going back. I know we all often mention these things, but like the whole sort of Star Wars era, where suddenly, whether it was television or film or whatever studio, um, suddenly everybody was like, "Oh, have we got one of those, and we got a sci-fi film that we can, you know, but get out." No, there. this is this is different because that's reacting to something that was popular. That's 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 seeing something that comes out is a massive hit and they go, we want one of those. This is a case of they because they always come out within months of each other. This is true, actually. In fact, they're they're in. Yeah, they're in production at the same time. Yeah, there's no way for them to actually, you know, so somebody say, oh, that's done really well. Let's make it and put it out there. And then it'd be like a month later. It would take at least a year or two for that to happen. So it's it's very strange how at the studio system you'll get two films with this you know with a similar idea come out at the same time yeah yeah i know we we well as i said we we had it with um we had it with robin hood we had it with uh wire Earp, we had it with the armageddon and you know the like deep you said impact. the asteroid films and deep impact so on and so on so deep yeah impact Deep impact. That's it. Deep yeah. impact. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say it a couple more times. <laughs> I, th- I think we've got this phenomenon today that 
I don't know about you, but when when I'm talking, I can't hear what you're saying, and if we're crossing over and vice versa, I don't know. Oh, right. Are you getting that today? Um, no. Yeah. But obviously, you are. Oh well, it's good. Yeah. We 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 press on. It's not a problem. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, you know, I remember I remember the the the, the Robin Hood film. Um, you know, and it's one of those names. John Irvin is one of those names that you sort of remember out there, but. Um, uh yeah he hasn't you know he he doesn't necessarily have a a stamp on his films he kind of does a bit of everything doesn't this is the thing um i I agree with you that the fact that he hasn't he hasn't got like a personal stamp on it i mean there's other directors who do all kinds of different films and yet you can you can turn it on and straight away you can tell who made that film yeah with him you you can't. That's he doesn't like have a personal stamp on it. That's why I think that he's not that well known. That he, you know, because of the films he's done, he should have he should have been a bit more famous than he actually is. But people don't really, you know, haven't really heard of him. I have to say, I didn't, I had, I didn't know him as a director. I had seen his films, you know, over the years, but never, you know, I wouldn't say I couldn't tell that was a film that was made by him. Yeah, I mean, it's like when I was looking at his filmography, I saw that he made that film Shiner years ago, the Michael Caine one, where his son's a boxer that gets killed. Right. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, you're just like, oh, okay. He's, he's still making films. You yeah, know, well, apparently he's... he is. Yeah, right. I mean, he sort of, I mean, he was born in 1940 in Newcastle on Tyne. And he, and he, um, he sort of had his peak, I guess, in the sort of, you know, late eighties, early nineties. I mean, like, 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 like you. I remember, um, you know, in the early nineties, I used to work in a in a video shop. Um, you know, back when we had them, and yeah. uh, <laughs> I do remember, you know, posters for, for some of the films. Um, you, you know, hanging in the in, in the in the video library, and you know, seeing the name John irvin and whatever in there in, oh by the way the other thing interesting about robin hood um i noticed that john mctiernan actually produced that yes yes i saw that yeah, yeah. and i saw uh, a very early appearance by david morrissey who's mm. very unrecognizable as little john as little john yeah yeah no i noticed that i was like uh, it was actually i mean i i revisited it as yes. part of this um so I did re- I. Yeah, I revisited the stuff that I could get hold of easily. So as it happened, it was really weird. But um, at the weekend, Robin Hood was actually shown on the Sony channel. And I was like, oh, how serendipitous is that? You know, so, um, uh, yes, watched it. But, uh, yeah, you know, it was it was entertaining enough, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's just, um, I yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And um, I, I sort of I remember seeing it. I remember the whole sort of Marion being, you know, pretending to be a, a boy and all that kind of stuff. And I, I always I always loved the bit where um, the the main villain, who isn't the sheriff of Nottingham, <laughs> uh, you know, he's been stabbed, and there's all the merry men dressed up as fools, and he looks at them, and they all go, "Welcome to hell." <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I must admit, I mean, one of the things that made me chuckle about it. Um, I mean, you know, um, Patrick Bergen, I guess, was kind of man man of the moment in a way because he'd had like sleeping with the enemy and all that sort of thing that had come out the, around the same time. Yes. But um, one of the things I, I didn't like about it and I thought was kind of laughable was the whole Irma Thurman made uh. Marion dressed up as a boy made me think of Bob in Blackadder. <laughs> I, was, I was like, how, how does he not know? It's like Blackadder and Bob, you know? <laughs> I thought that uh, was a bit my, silly. <laughs> no, I have to say, my favourite line from that episode of Blackadder was, um, well, I may be a quack, but at least I'm not a ducky. <laughs> yes, indeed, with the, uh, the leeches, <laughs> the, the leeches yeah, yeah, yeah. and the doctor, what, yes. Why yes. is it leeches for everything? <laughs> I love it. I love it that we've managed to incorporate Blackadder into our uh, podcast mm. as well. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, let's uh, let's get on with it. So, uh, Keith, what was your pick for Movie Heaven? Right. Well, my pick for Movie Heaven in the end was a film that I hadn't seen before, um, but I quite fancied the sound of it. So yeah. 
managed to acquire the uh, DVD on, on Amazon. Um, and it was his film Ghost Story, made in 1981, uh, an adaptation of the book by Peter Straub, or Straub, I think it's Straub, it's pronounced. It's Straub, yeah. Yeah, um, which was written in 1979. Um, yeah, I thought, I'd, I thought I'd give this a go, because I hadn't seen it, and it sounded quite intriguing. Um Clive Ashenden, who's one of our, you know, guest podcasters on occasions, um, I, I talked to him about it and he said, and he said he didn't mind me quoting him on this, uh, oh, yeah. that the novel is, is probably one of the best ghost stories he's ever read, uh, which he actually shares with, since doing some research on it, Stephen King uh, puts it up there along with Rosemary's Baby. Oh, okay. So it's like, wow, okay. Um, what, the the film or the book? No, sorry, the book. I'm talking the about book. the novel here, okay. which I haven't read. I must admit, right. I haven't read the novel. But no, I decided jo John Irvin, uh, 1981, uh, made this, so I decided to give it a go. A um, few like interesting bits about it. I mean, it was actually the uh, final films for some of Hollywood's, you know, biggest legendary. Uh, actors um, from the past. It was actually the last film for Fred Astaire, uh, Melvin Douglas, and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. So um, you know, it, it had some, you, you know, some Hollywood heavyweights from the the old Hollywood system, the old school in there. Also had John Houseman, uh, the man with the wonderful voice that it I remember. Does indeed, from, I was. You know, John Carpenter's The Fog <laughs> and Scrooged. And Scrooge, yes, indeed. Yeah, I, I sort of recognised the voice, and I went, I, I know that voice from somewhere. And I, I looked him up, and I'm going, I'm sure, I'm sure he's in Scrooge, and it because he's listed as himself, not as an actor. So that was why I found it quite. I had to really look to to try and find him, but uh, very distinctive voice. So. A very distinctive voice. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, you know, I know we've already done the Carpenter podcast, but you know. Uh, the story he tells at the beginning of the fog is is just fantastic. And uh, interestingly enough, this film takes starts off with with him, him telling a story, which uh, you, you know, which he he's very good at. Uh, mm. Also, also starring in the film was um, uh, Craig Wasson, who obviously shortly after was in uh, De Palma's Body Double. Yeah. Um, uh, playing dual roles in this, incidentally, playing twins. Yes. And um, it also had uh, Alice, is it Alice Krieg? 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 Yeah, Krieg. Alice Krieg, Krieg. who, yes. who I, I obviously remember as, as as the Borg queen in Star Trek First Contact that also reprised the role in, in an episode of Voyager as well. So, yes, um, but I mean, also up to that point had done quite a few horror films, including uh, Sleepwalkers, the Stephen King. Uh, adaptation oh right yes which was very good if, mm. if memory serves quite enjoyed that i think back in and the I day have to say personally i thought alice creep was brilliant in this yes absolutely I she was really really good yeah and not and not uh, and, and not to do a tackism here but not because she had a kit off for most <laughs> of it <laughs> oh blimey i mean that you know uh, you got uh, female nudity in this, but you also got male nudity. I mean, when Craig Watson at the beginning goes out the window, and I mean, full frontal, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was like the, I have to say, that was that effect of him falling looked terrible. <laughs> I yeah. Know. I don't know if, I, if that was good for those standards, but now it was kind of laughable. Well, again, it was... Um, uh... Whitman, wasn't it, that did a lot of the uh, effects? Whitlock, sorry, Albert Whitlock, who we mentioned in a in a previous podcast oh, about in the, the thing. In the thing, we? yes, yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, I guess you know, they, they, it was obviously of of its time, of, yes. of the time as far as that sort of thing goes. But what what really struck me about it is I found it quite an interesting story because it's one of these stories that takes place, you know, over two time periods. You, you've got the the contemporary or the 80s as it was you know when it was actually set but also um with with the with the characters as young men back in the in the 1920s um 
uh, era as well. Um, so, you know, it was it was quite nicely done. Um, it set up, you know, a bit of a mystery uh, with regards to, um, y- you know, Craig Wasson plays the son of, is it Douglas Fairbanks' character? I'm trying it to remember Douglas, now. It is yeah. Douglas Fairbanks. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, and as I said, he's playing twins and, and one of them, uh, you know, mysteriously dies, you know, through through bad visual effects or whatever <laughs> um, but uh yeah. but um you, you know th- this this causes them to you, you know you know the four of them had formed a little club um a gentleman's club you know where they where they drink and smoke cigars and tell stories and uh you know it, they, they'd all been harboring a secret uh, a dark secret from from their past when they were when they were very young men um that involved a, 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 a woman uh, who they, they were all quite taken with, um, yeah. played also by a- a- Alice Krieg. Again, has got two, two um, roles in this. She's got a modern day um, counterpart and obviously yes. the, 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 the girl uh, from the backstory. Um, and, you, you know, they, they, they basically think they've, there's an accident and they think they've killed her. And, they decide to dispose of the body in a in a um in a lake and put her in a car and push it into the lake and and you, you know only to realize as it's going under that she's that she's not actually dead and then of course she she drowns and uh, they have to carry this guilty secret with them for for their whole lives and you know they have lives they get married and you know, they they move on and they have children and you know all sorts of things. But then this this comes back to haunt them. Yeah. No. Sorry. I just wanted to say that uh, that was very effective in the backstory. The whole the the bit when she you see her wake up in the car, and they all sort of tell each other, don't they? Oh no, no, we didn't see anything. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh no, but she she's still and they like, no, we didn't see anything, and uh, they let her drown. Yeah, I mean, they do let her drown. They let her drown, and then and then strange things start happening in the present. Um, yeah, I mean it. It takes. Um, I mean it, it's it's like I would say what fifty years later mm-hmm. when she comes back to haunt them. Yeah, fifty years. Yeah, absolutely. And um, well, I, I I have a few problems with the story. I I think they, they they kind of sort of set out this idea that the the club they're in they tell ghost stories to each other because the, the wives saying, Oh, you're always, you know, telling each other these scary stories and it's starting to affect you, but you, you never really see that. They, they only use it two times really. Um, once where the son, uh, the Craig Wassons, um, tells the story about what happened to him. And then the actual backstory of what happened to the group. And, and of course, so the stuff that happens outside of that, I, I didn't find that interesting because they all sort of kind of get scared to death or, or something like that, you know. And there's also other characters that really don't have much effect on the story. And I personally think what they should have done is that they should have just, for most part, just have kept them in the room and they're telling ghost stories. And then... It, it comes to, you know, so they could have had other ghost stories in there as well as just sort of concentrating on, you know, this, you know, just this one ghost story. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a good way of sort of doing like, um, you know, telling the background of the story and all that stuff and exposition. But it, it would have been nice to have just kept those guys in the room. I know other films have done that. I know like anthology films, they've used that where they have four people in a room and each one tells them a ghost story. But I think in this case, I think it would have been worked better if they were sort of more contained than trying to sort of spread it out over like days and stuff. I know what you mean. Um, I, I think, you know, it would have been a slightly different movie, but it, but it would have worked had they done it that way. I mean, mm. you know, what, what's interesting with this sort of structurally, you know, I'm always kind of, you know, I watch films obviously primarily for entertainment, but I've got quite good at sort of making it a, a, a split thing where I'm I'm watching it with my filmmaker head on and yeah. also 
you know a geeky audience member head on as well but um what's interesting structurally about this is is they kind of have two different flashbacks in this movie you've you've yes. got you've got one flashback from the 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 Craig Wasson character um you know about his backstory how he meets this girl um, you know, played by uh, Alice uh, Creek. Alice yeah. Creek. I, I'm terrible. I haven't learned any of the character names, which is probably not making oh, this okay. great. Well, she um, she plays because I, I watched this recently. So right, um, the character from the past is Eva, and the character that uh, Craig Wasson's character uh, has an affair with, a very sordid affair, uh, is Alma. Alma, that's right. Alma and Eva. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and then of course they they then also have the flashback, um, you know, to the the early late twenties, early thirties, whenever it is. Mm. The the older guys as young men, and with with her playing Eva at that point. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, it, it's 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 a very well made film, uh, generally speaking. I think again, it doesn't have anything that gives it a particular like you don't watch this and think oh this is a john irvin film you watch no, this and think no. this is just an entertaining ghost story film <laughs> yeah it feels very old school <laughs> yes yes it, it does feel like it was made by an old school hollywood director who's sort of making his like swan song instead of it being like a second film it's, um you, you, you know and talking of swan songs i mean you know very much the case for those those great uh, you know those those three great Hollywood you know old Hollywood stars that uh, that that were in this film and yeah. and did a great job. I mean I mean you know uh, again a podcast can't go by without me mentioning something like this. But just before <laughs> he made this film, which was his yeah. last film, Fred Astaire actually appeared in an episode of the classic, the original Battlestar Galactica playing Starbucks long lost father in an episode which he did um you know to to cuz his grandchildren or whatever were really into Battlestar Galactica okay. so he he appeared in an episode of that and then he made this film and then like about a year later he died was that the original series or was that the that 1980s one oh no no no, no 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 it was, it the, was original the original series, series. yes yes no, <laughs> <Yeah. it's... laughs> what? do you not like the the series with the kids who can jump really high and Funny the enough, flying no, bikes <laughs> no that's a whole nother podcast as i like saying but uh, we could talk galactica both old and new but uh, mm. but yeah no but, but but you know fred astaire he did that and then he did this film and then um sadly uh shortly after passed away but um you, you know a very a very heartfelt performance by him in this um i thought acting wise it was very good i thought he was the best thing in it yeah yeah i i really liked him in it i i thought he was he was really very very good i think douglas fairbanks was he he was the first one of the group to go so he didn't really have much to do did he no exactly it was weird he was the first one of the group to go in the film but the last one of the three to die in real life Oh, okay. <laughs> Which, but uh yeah he had less to do um yeah. and uh but yeah you know they were all good but yeah i think fred astaire and, and not a step of dancing in it <laughs> no. but uh yeah. you, you, you know yeah. um it worked well uh as i said the the fact it was a little bit disjointed um in terms of structure mm. i didn't have a problem with actually i thought um I thought it worked, uh, I, although I do absolutely take your point that they could have, they could have kept the, the the four older actors, you know, together in that room. Which, you know, again at the beginning they set it up quite spooky, you know, darkened yeah. room and all this sort of thing. But then they they moved away from that quite quickly, didn't they, into real life? They also did one of those annoying things where they sort of you come in at the end of a story, and you're just like. Oh, I, that would have been a good way to set this up. You know, you could have had like give it like a really good spooky feel at the beginning, where you know you have you know talking about a story, or even a story which kind of relates to the um, the twin being killed. Yeah, you know, and it's just yeah, it's kind of like, and then he cried. <laughs> it was like, uh, 
Yeah. And so you just sort of come in at the end of a, of a story, which is a, it's a shame. Yeah, they, they kind of jumped straight into it. Also, editorially, it was quite interesting because I, I thought to myself, you know, you know, you watch films and you sort of watch them as a product of, the, of their time and think, oh, you know, do they still hold up and whatever? And and I, I think had this been made, even if it had been shot the same as it was um, now, I think editorially they would have sprinkled the the past story and the present story up more than they did. Because what was interesting yes. is it was kind yeah. of, you know, when, when we got to the, um, you know, the prohibition era type thing, that was all in one chunk, really, wasn't it? Towards the the the, the third act. I, actually, to tell the truth, I, I kind of agree with you, but I f think the way that they, the story set out, they couldn't, they couldn't have done it really because the end of the day, it, it is a mystery, mm -hmm. and you don't know what it is that they've done that this uh, avenging ghost would come back and haunt them, that would want them dead. So to to have like uh, the backstory sprinkled out throughout it wouldn't have really worked. No, well, well obviously the reveal of of the um, the Eva character wouldn't have worked properly that way either. But um... and also the fact that it's told as a story. That is told within that room. So, and that also with uh, Craig Wasson's, where his flashback when he talks about having, you know, this sort of relationship with Alma, this very sort of sexual relationship, and she just wanted him to bring him back, didn't she, and mm -hmm. get married in his hometown so that he could meet his family. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and again, he's telling that as a story to the to to the guys that are left, isn't he? So yeah. yeah. Um, but but uh, yeah, you know, it, it was it was nicely done. I, I think I need to mention as well that um, I believe it was Dick Miller who did the uh, effects for the um, uh, for the ghost. I believe. Okay. I think I think he did like the you know the the the, the face the skeleton that that uh, or disintegrates and whatever. I think I think it was Dick right. Miller that did okay. that. Right. Okay. No, it's not Dick Miller. It's, it's Dick in... Smith. Dick Smith. Sorry. Yes, yes, you're right. And also on his uh, team was Rick Baker. Wow. Okay. Early days. Early Rick days, Baker. indeed. Okay. Well, I mean, not that early. 1981. Oh, I mean, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, wasn't... I mean, that was the same year as American World in London. Bloody hell. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. God, no time flies. Oh dear. <laughs> but yeah, um but, but but actually and that's the other thing. I think this and it goes back to what the point you were making about John Irwin is I think it felt it felt like it was a film that was older than that mm. in some respects, you know? Um but uh but yeah, I mean it was competently made. There wasn't I mean, I got the region one DVD of it because it was the only where I could find it available, but um, oh, okay. even though it was widescreen and whatever, it didn't have any. Um, there was no supplemental material, so it was very. I did a bit of looking around the internet and stuff, but um, there isn't a lot of information about the the making of this film out there. I mean, it was before they, st and obviously, John Irving was kind of before the times of directors doing commentaries and things of that nature. So. Um, it's been a bit difficult to, to to find out too much about it. But, you know, in terms of does it work and does it stand on its own feet? I would say um, absolutely. You know, it's, it was enjoyable. Hence why I decided to pick it as, um, you know, there were only a few of them I had access to. But, um, you, you, you know, I watched a few films and I decided, no, this one was probably the most interesting one to talk about. Hence why I... Uh, I decided to make that my movie heaven for John Irvin. I just want to add that um, I, I looked online too, just for material about John Irvin, like an interview or anything. There's nothing. I mean, I, I, I barely found people reviewing his films, which I thought was like crazy because, you know, he has, he's made so many films and, and films that people like. So uh, yeah, I thought that was really strange. Yeah. I mean, it, but it, it, I'm trying to, that just leads me into my pick. Um, I did find that the the film that I've picked for Movie Heaven, a lot of people don't like, and I found that really strange. I think it's due to the fact that um, 
back in the early 90s, it was part of a free video set uh, on home video from CBS Fox. I had it. So <laughs> you had it. <laughs> I had it too. Yay. And, um, and of course, the other two films you got with it was Commando and Predator. Yes. And sandwiched in the middle was my pick, which is Raw Deal. Hey. Yeah, no, I, I had exactly the same uh, VHS uh, Fox box set, which basically, yes, it had those three movies uh, in matching spines and all of that stuff, didn't it? It was, it was very right, nicely yeah. done. But uh, uh, to be fair, I probably watched Predator the most in that box set. <laughs> <laughs> no, true. Uh, I, I have a real fondness for Commando and Predator, but I also like this film. I mean, it's the only film um that arnold schwarzenegger does a, a kind of gangster flick mm -hmm. i mean it's a, a revenge thriller where uh arnold schwarzenegger is this uh local town sheriff uh who is recruited by his old uh, bureau buddy to go undercover and tear up a gangster organization uh run by um Oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Wanamaker. Yes. Sam Wanamaker. Yeah. As as the head gangster. Of course, the reason why Sam Wanamaker was doing that film was because at the time he was paying for the Globe. Ah, right. Okay. Because you you know we've got uh, the Globe in central London got refurbished and everything, and this was due to Sam Wanamaker. And what he kept doing was he kept taking roles in films like this so he could pay for all that. Uh, renovation i mean big shakespeare fan and um, but unfortunately he never lived to see it being finished that's a shame isn't it yes because the globe is quite a uh, impressive place to visit and and go and watch some shakespeare if, if one's inclined to do that and uh yes i've been there and it is it's quite remarkable so yeah yeah so when i was at school uh me and my friends would always talk about uh this film and we would always quote from it i mean we also quoted from commando terminator predator <laughs> <laughs> all the armyisms yeah <laughs> yeah and uh films like first blood and rocky and, and stuff like that but we 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 particularly love action films with with guns and stuff and you certainly got it in this film <laughs> oh yes we did yeah so we're talking about uh, I, raw deal aren't we <laughs> were we talking about raw deal yes <laughs> 90, was that 1986 87 1986 1986 yeah yes okay and um again i i didn't realize who the director of it was but um it it's it's, it's a really well shot film i mean but everything's very central have you noticed that well, i mean all these framings very central so you get stuff like um so the very first shot is a train coming towards you and you get uh, these assassins get in, get they get off the train, they join up and they attack this um, FBI safe house, which is really well done. And these assassins are a bunch of hard asses, uh, uh, which you never see again. They yeah, never yeah. appear in the film ever again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean it, it, it's uh, one of the things I because I watched it at the weekend. I, I revisited this. I hadn't watched it in in some time. Um, Yes, I, I owned it on, on VHS back in the day. Um, it's one of those films, actually, that interestingly, I never upgraded to a DVD or a Blu-ray of it. Um, you know, lots of my old VHS, which um, I got rid of, you know, back in the sort of early noughties or whatever. Um, you know, I replaced quite a lot of them with, with DVD and then subsequently Blu-ray for certain things as well. And uh yeah, this was one that I that I hadn't updated, so I hadn't seen in a while. Um, but yeah, what struck me about it from, you know, from the photography point of view and from the direction point of view of it was uh, they they staged scenes to really use the frame, where pretty much a lot of the scenes were done in a one with very little coverage whatsoever. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. there, there were inserts of key things like guns and, you know, all those obligatory <laughs> things. But, um, but yeah, I mean, th there were, yeah, quite, quite a lot of it was acted out in the, in the um, and, and this weekend was probably the first time I've ever seen this film in its proper aspect ratio, actually. Cause they, Same here. Because those VHSs were all sort of pan and scanned, 
you know, four by three, weren't they? So that's um, right. And this was cinema, cinema scope. Yeah. Yeah. It was two thirty five. So, um, uh, but, but yeah, um, I, I enjoyed it a hell of a lot more than I, than I thought I was going to actually, <laughs> mm. uh, the eighties violence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's got some great, um, Oh, it just it brought a smile to my face because I just remembered so much of it, and it, it's I don't know for a, a hard bitten revenge thriller. There's just a lot of fun in it. I mean, um, I mean, I always loved I loved the bit at the beginning where Schwarzenegger's chasing the the guy on the motorcycle. Yes, yeah, and that that's just that's, it's just just a great credit sequence which ends with him lighting his stogie, and you can imagine him on the day go. Does it have to be my doggy? <laughs> you know? Yeah, ah, doggy, and you know he takes like a puff of it, and then he throws it into the gasoline, and it lights up, and the guy goes flying off his bike. And uh, yeah, I was just, it was just sort of, it brought a smile to my face because it's just, it, it is, it's, it's like, um, it's just full of all these sort of eighties action movie cliches. Yeah, I mean, it was the first time I saw the whole. He's coming down the lift. Let's shoot it all out. Oh no, he's not in the lift. He's somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a lot of. I dread to think how many rounds of ammunition were fired in this film. Oh, there was quite a few. Of it. But but what 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 I found interesting from the sort of Arnold point of view is mm. yes, we had the obligatory you know shirt off scene and biceps yes. and watching him tool up with guns and you know wearing a black leather jacket and all this sort of thing. <laughs> but through a majority of the film. This was actually quite a different look for Arnold, wasn't it? Yes. He was a much, you know, he had the sort of gelled back hair and he was a much sort of, you know, wearing suits and he, he was much more of a sort of suave version of Arnie than what we were used to seeing at that point. Exactly. It reminded me of when he, uh, at the beginning of True Lies, when he's in a tuxedo. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he was He was much more... Uh, sort of a, a refined almost you know in some respects in inverted commas but james bond-esque type character um in this with of course the the obvious arnie tropes as well you know with yes. machine guns and you know muscle vests and <laughs> yeah, yeah you know. and also one-liners i mean uh, my favorite one-liners um when he walks down the alleyway and these three thugs go to beat him up and they, they get interrupted by the FBI and the guy's looking at him and he's he's looking at his ID and he goes, what does the P stand for? And Arnie goes, pussy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> well, the, it's funny, the one thing I remembered from it, and I'm guessing it was because it was in the trailer or something, which I probably saw loads, you know, growing up, um, was there's there's a shot where he... Uh, throws a guy up onto a like um, yes! pillar, but yeah. then he then he fixes his hair, and that That's for some right, reason yeah. I always <laughs> kind of remembered that it was weird, but you know he kind of puts his his gelled back slick back hair in back in place or whatever, and um, uh, but but yeah, it's 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 um, it's an interesting film. Uh, it's certainly I I didn't think it was a badly made film at all from a you, you know from. Oh. John Irwin's uh, point of view. Um, interestingly, I, I noticed it was kind of uh, quite self-indulgent in some respects. But um, w when he goes to the oil company, it is actually called the Irvin Oil Oil. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, lo I love little Easter eggs like that, but this was quite in your face, wasn't it? It was like bloody hell. Well, subtle. but then again, I never noticed that until I saw... I saw it this weekend, and I think on the pan and scan you wouldn't have seen it. Probably not. Yeah, that's a good. But point. on the on the widescreen version, there it is, Irvin Oil, and you're just like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> made, that made me chuckle, and um, and of course, I mean, th this also featured um, very much. He was sort of the man of the moment, career wise, at this point. Uh, Robert Darvey, who who had you know yes. obviously been involved or, or would have been coming up in in the. Uh, in Die Hard and later, you know, as a Bond villain and, and right. things of that nature. Uh, License to Kill. Interesting to see him in a, in a you know, as, as a sort of um, foil to, well, trying to be a foil to <laughs> Arnold in this film. <laughs> well, he's the one who um, discovers uh, Arnold's 
um, identity. Yes. Because no, he was the only one who was kind of suspicious of him while everybody else wasn't because, you know, nobody knew um, that he was working for the FBI because the, why he's brought in is because there's a, a mole in the bureau who's given away, you know, he's, he's under the um, control of um, Sam Wanamaker's character, which is uh, Luigi Pachavetta. <laughs> <laughs> perfect name eh? perfect yeah. gangster name <laughs> indeed <laughs> and um and so yeah so he's the only one who's is suspicious of him all the time he really doesn't trust him and i love the bit when they go to um that club that's it's all uh male performers isn't it yes that's right yes <laughs> uh, they're, they're there to sort of um rough up the owner because he's paying uh the other gangster in town lemansky yeah Who's the? I think he's like the the Jewish gangster, isn't he? That's right. He comes off very Jewish. Yeah. And um, and I just love the bit in the changing room where um, Robert Davies going to kill him. He's got the knife out, and Arnie grabs him and pushes him along the mirror with the with the uh, bulbs bursting. Yeah. And then throws. Um, that was a real trailer moment, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, it was, wasn't it? I remember that from the trailer. And then throws um, nail polish on his face. You know, red nail polish, and he goes. You know, this is what you're going to look like when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's a decent action thriller, isn't it? It's, yeah. You know, it's 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 quite a it's a reasonably good story. Um, you know, he's surrounded by you know some good acting talent in this film as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I can see why you picked it as movie heaven. I think uh, I think it's. Uh, if you look at the resume of um, uh, John Irvin, I think this is this is certainly one of the highlights that's in there, you know. But yet people really, uh, this was the thing that made me quite surprised that uh, the, the reviews I saw, everybody was kind of damning on it. Really? I was like, wow, why? This is this is a fun flick. You know, this it just I, I just enjoyed it from beginning to end. Yeah. And you know, I don't know. I now this does come in the part of his career where uh John Irvin went back to England and he did two films back to back. He did Champion and Turtle Beach. Okay. I've and I've not seen either of those. I've I've not seen either either one of them, but uh but Champion's got John Hurt as a uh, jockey who's um, he has leukemia and he has to sort of come back from that and be, be a jockey again. So it's like one of those sort of, you know, um, person overcoming something to, you know, to go back to glory. Mm -hmm. And then there was this other film called Turtle Beach, which uh, was reviewed very well. And then I think, I think what they had against it, I, it seemed to be was that, that he he made these two films which were like really good and personal and stuff and then he just went off and did a dumb hollywood picture with arnold schwarzenegger and it's just like i i don't see that as a negative this is this really well made 80s action film you know which was a lot of fun yeah i mean it was very enjoyable i mean it's it's you know it, you just watch it and enjoy it and uh you know, at the end, you think, "Wow, that was that was a lot of fun." I mean, the use of music's in it is great. Um, I love the the track they use over the opening credits when he's doing the chase. The the use of um, "Can't Get No Satisfaction." Yeah, which they must have paid a shitload for that, eh? <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Um, and the fact that it's it, they it's actually playing from his tape deck. That's so right. In when he quarry, smashes into one of the um, like dump trucks. The, the music stops playing. Yeah. Yeah. No, he literally puts the tape in the, in the, it shows how old it is, the tape in the car stereo <laughs> in the quarry, doesn't he? And goes around shooting. I mean, that's a great scene in terms of stunts and action, isn't it? That, yeah. uh, that quarry I mean, scene. Totally unnecessary, really, but. <laughs> but still it's a great action sequence. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> the end of the day, because um, it, it comes about because he, what they do is uh, Robert Davy comes up with this idea of trapping him by um, letting him confront uh, the guy who who's gotten put him up to this uh, at his son's grave, and um, 
you know, and it's a trick to see, you know, if he's going to kill him or not, or, you know, if not, they can kill both of them at the same time. And, um, and so, you know, Arnie sort of, he escapes while his friend gets injured. So they know he is, you know, he's been found out and now he's got to, you know, kill them all. And, you know, instead of going straight to their, you know, headquarters, their underground headquarters that has a casino. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, um, goes to what they call the, the pit where um, uh, part of the story was that uh, a whole lot of uh, money and drugs were seized by the FBI that belongs to uh, Petra Vita and they, they, he wanted it back and they come up with a scheme that actually Arnold Schwarzenegger comes up with of um, making it out that there's somebody out there trying to bomb police stations. And so when they phone in a bomb threat for the station, this money and all the smack is uh, being held that they go and rob it. They turn up as bomb disposal and they, and they rob it. It's, 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 it's a great idea and it works really well. So uh, they they have all this stuff at the money pit. So when he comes in, guns blazing and, and shooting everybody, um, you know, you see that there's that wonderful moment at the end where it's all quiet and you just see the wind blowing in through this um, this office that's there and you just see the money and the drugs sort of blowing in the wind. But really, he didn't need to go there. He could have gone straight to the underground lair and, you know, gone to business there. And they may not have been prepared for him because – after he's been to the pit, they are well prepared for it. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> I mean, they've even got his uh, Arnie's old mate, uh, Sven Old Forsen, there as a, a bearded bodyguard who's the most unluckiest person out of the lot because he jumps up behind the bar and he starts firing the gun and there's no bullets and it's just clicking. And he's like, oh, sh you can see the look on his face. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> No, absolutely. Um, no, I mean, the, the set pieces in this, you know, from a, um, you know, a, a choreograph and stunt and, and action point of view, are, are, you know, are very good. Um, mm. Lots of pyrotechnics used. Um, yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I, I, have to, I did laugh at the fact that um, when they get, um, oh, um, oh, God, what's uh, Lemansky, um, they... When they're doing the heist at the police station, they also go and attack Lemansky. And they have this chase in the car. And the thing is, Lemansky's car is bulletproof. Yes. And it just kept, you kept seeing these uh, close ups on the glass that said bullet resistant. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just to hammer it home in case you know yeah. it It wasn't like one close up, there was like three close ups of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I don't know. I might I might not have my facts right here, but um, I seem okay. to remember something. I mean, th this is produced by Dino De Laurentiis, yeah, this film. That's correct, yes. And I, I'd heard somewhere that he made this to try and help fund or try and help get Total Recall off of the ground. Um, I think it may have been an Arnold Schwarzenegger interview or something that that, 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 that was said in, but um, I, I, I don't know don't know about that it, it it sounds very uh familiar uh i think it is from the total recall um dvd right and quite possibly i think i i know that uh dino de Laurentiis did have the rights to total recall for a while and uh arnold was under contract with him hence why um james cameron had to wait for Arnie because he was off filming uh, Conan the Destroyer. That's right, because of course the Conan movies were were De, De Laurentiis as well, weren't they? So yes, that's right. Yeah, and of course uh, De, La De Laurentiis felt that he owned Arnold because he discovered him. Right. Even though Arnold had done uh, Hercules in New York. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that classic. That classic. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> And also, you know, what well, his big break was Pumping Iron. Yes. Uh, have you seen Pumping Iron? Um, I think I saw it kind of way back in the day, but to be perfectly honest with you, I can't remember it. It was, I mean, it's one of these documentaries that you don't have to be into bodybuilding to enjoy, but you really see uh, Arnold's personality come out in that. And he is, you know, he is just like the star of that documentary, even though it's got um, 
oh, the chap who went on to play the Incredible Hulk. Oh, Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, poor Lou Ferrigno. He, he gets destroyed in this in that documentary. Because um, not only is Arnold a very good bodybuilder, but he's also very good at playing mind games and, you know, psyching out his competition. Hence why he's, you know, he was Mr. Universe, you know, so many times. Yeah. But no, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it watching it again after, um, you, you know, quite some time. And I, I thought, yeah, this is a decent Arnie movie of that era. There's there's plenty of action in it. And, uh, you, you know, it certainly wasn't a badly made film. Um, I did think uh, the ending, um, oh. you, you know, it was interesting because, uh, you, you know, it had Darren McGavin in it playing his friend who was sort of, uh, quite well known as being the what is it, Colchet, the, the the Night Stalker guy. Um, but, oh right. But before that, I mean, I, I've said on this podcast before that you know, as as a kid and obviously later revisited as an adult, I was kind of into the uh, the Six Million Dollar Man. And uh, oh, right. in the original pilot that I didn't see until I was an adult, um, Darren McGavin actually plays a character called Oliver Spencer, who's the sort of Oscar Goldman before Oscar Goldman, if you know what I mean. And uh, okay. there's a very similar scene where it's Steve Austin who's the one on the rails trying to walk, and and he's probing him, not the other way around, which was quite funny. But the, the way they kind of did the freeze frame with them laughing at the end, I mean, <laughs> it did seem a little yeah. bit, I expected it to be like, please squad, and like <laughs> furniture to fall over behind them. Or something, you know? <laughs> I, I know what you mean. The, um, the, 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 we kind of have like two endings, so you have the ending where um, Arnie sort of he 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 drives off to a, an airport to see off um, his friend, this girl that he's befriend for all this called Monique, and um, of course she's sort of um, she's uh, Robert Davies' spy, isn't she? That's right. She's she's spying on him for, and but they become friends, and of course she's. It, it's that weird thing where he 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 doesn't have like a a relationship with her. They're not lovers. He he sees her as a friend. You know, you're a friend. You're more than friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so he sees her off, and then you see the 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 FBI agent sort of fly in. He said, "Oh, I knew you were one of us," and then you sort of fades to black, and then you go to this bit where uh, Darren McGavin is, you know, uh, he's sitting in a wheelchair and the nurse is trying to get him to walk on these poles and he's not having it. He's really, you know, it's kind of like he's given up on life, even though he's got what he wanted. You know, the Petrovita family are uh, no more. They are wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, but yet he's not happy. And it takes Arnie to sort of get him going. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was very sort of TV movie ending with uh, them hugging and it just freeze frame and into black. Uh, yeah, they could have ended that a bit better, but I guess it was a way of um, wrapping it all up because he there's a lot of exposition there where Arnie says how he's got back with his wife and they're expecting a child and everything, and he's gonna call it after uh, he's gonna call it Blair after the son that got murdered at the beginning, and um, but yeah. Um, very sort of TV movie. If anything, it it looks like it may have been a reshoot. Right, maybe, maybe, maybe they screen tested it and people weren't quite happy with the ending, so they added they tacked this on. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't know. But uh, yeah, interesting though, and and you know, not a bad movie by any by any means. So uh, I it. I certainly see why you chose it for heaven. So um, Arnie should never say murdered, mutilated, and molested. <laughs> what, in one <laughs> sentence? In one sentence, he does. Um, when he's seen, uh, when he's uh, met by Darren McGavin at the beginning, where he he does that, he has that video presentation where he shows the uh, the head of the family, and they're in court and they're sort of you know propositioned and everything and. Um, of course, the, the guy who turns out to be the mole was this uh, prosecutor that actually forced Arnie out of the um, at the out of the bureau. 
you know, is it resign or be prosecuted any way you want it? And he said, you remember the case, this guy murdered, molested and mutilated. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! Yes, I was like, you know, they did many takes, and that was probably the best one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, did you ever see uh, the Simpsons episode where they had uh, Wolf Castle playing? Um, oh, that um, it's like the Atom or something like that. Right? No, I. I, and I he's he's got he's got a line. He's got to say up an atom. It's at an it's up an atom up an atom. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it reminded me. Of. Go, oh. Gotta love Arnie though. Gotta yes. love Arnie. Hey, we we grew yes, up indeed. with this guy. You know what I mean? He's he's yes, sir. yeah. He's in the culture, and mm. now he's back in movies. There you go. <laughs> yeah, not doing very well, unfortunately. Well, you know that's again another podcast, right? <laughs> that's it. Yes, yes. Right. Well. And now we have to go to movie house. Uh, so, Keith, what is your choice? Okay, well, I looked, I looked through, um, you know, John Irwin's uh, resume to sort of see, you know, what, 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 what can I look at here? What do I know? What don't I know? And there was a film, and 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 just by the look of it, I thought, oh, that that looks a bit cheesy. That could either be really great or really awful. Um, it was made in the mid uh, 19, 19, 1994 film, okay, and it was called Free Four. It stars yeah. Eric Roberts, Jeff Fahey, and Pamela Gidley, okay. And yeah. I thought, well, let's try and get this. I managed to find it online, a used version of it online for one pound twenty. And I thought, okay, for one pound twenty, let's give this a uh, let's give this a whirl and 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 see. All right, right. now. Um, apparently this was originally intended for a theatrical release, but ended up going straight to VHS. And unfortunately the, the DVD that it came on, um, what it was just a four by three picture, although apparently this was shot two thirty five to one, uh, originally. So, uh, you know, straight away, you know, you know, it was sort of a compromised copy or whatever, but I thought, well, let's, let's. Let's take a look at this and see, you know, how it holds up and if it works. And um, yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but, yeah but, it didn't work. No. Did you see no. it? Did you see it? Yes, you I did saw manage it. to see it. OK, I, good. I, yeah, it's you, you could have saved your money. It was on YouTube. Oh, was it? OK, well, yeah, it was it was four by three as well. And it was. Yeah, um, I actually had to stop it at one point and come back to it later because i just i was so oh well what's interesting is he made this in 94 right so he made yeah. this nearly a decade you know eight years or whatever after um what we've just talked about raw deal yet it just you know it just doesn't it's like not very good at all and and it's like... no i i have to say i i i, I think from watching it it looks really like um they didn't have much money and they didn't have much to work with it was kind of like they have to do the story and they've only got these places to film and i just it, it just it was an awful mess i mean the fact that um the the first half is completely different to the second half yes and also i don't know if you knew this but i i, I read this that because uh, it's supposed to be in swaziland but they actually filmed it in Venezuela, well, it, which is quite obvious. Yeah, yeah, and they shot it at the most the famous Venezuelan falls. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, one one of the things, if I had to say something good about the film, because you know, you know, I always do try and find some good in everything. Is yeah, um, that there, there is. Uh, sadly, I only saw it in four to three, but I could tell there was some actually, actually some beautiful photography you know beautiful aerial photography and whatever of of the um you know of the falls, of, of, yeah. of the falls of the landscape but yeah i mean you know straight away that was a big problem you know he she was he was supposed to be sending her to to africa to to find this rare fictional hawk or whatever but it was clearly south america <laughs> you know yeah. um well that was the thing why not just say it was south exactly. america why why did there have to be africa that was really strange and of course this very rare eagle 
wasn't exactly that hard to find, was it? No, no. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it, it, it was so, it's so of the time. I mean, it was so like, you, you know, everybody was wearing like really high waistline trousers <laughs> and it, it had that <laughs> yeah. real sort of early 90s, you know, or, or almost late 80s having sort of blended into the early 90s feel about it. Um, it, it you know, you have Eric Roberts probably, you know, in the best shape he was ever in in his career with with a bit of a boof, a bit of a perfectly gelled hair bouffon going on. Um, yeah, tell me about it. I mean, it, it's literally that's the whole selling point of the film. The poster is him um, with, uh, I mean, I, I, didn't, I had to look at it quite a bit to figure out that he's actually got a parachute on his back. It actually looks like more like combat webbing or something like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, with a shotgun over his uh, over his shoulder and just like bare chest, and it, it it was it was it was very Eric Roberts porn, wasn't it? It was, it was. And then of course you have Jeff Fahey in this or Fahey, yeah. however it meant to pronounce that. But I mean, you know, this this was both fairly early in both their careers, I guess. I mean, they were both established, but um, yeah. um, you know, I'm guessing they were just in their early th- early to mid 30s you know the sort of that real sort of leading man era um that's right yeah. for them both and of course you've got uh pamela gidley who was it was it cherry 2000 or something was the film she that's was in. right yeah. yeah yeah um again you, you know looking very 80s looking very shannon doherty or whatever yes <laughs> <laughs> in this film um yes. as a wildlife photographer that works for um a magazine on, on photography that, that Jeff Fahey runs, or that at least that's the setup, isn't it? That's it. And she is engaged to Jeff Fahey's character, and uh, she, of course, he sends her off all around the world, and she she has been true to him all this time. Until <laughs> yeah, until she, she meets she, Eric Roberts. Yeah, and she's just turned into a total slut, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, only knows him for a date. And already fucking. I mean, God, these, it, was it? Um, it's this whole thing where she she has a recording of this rare eagle's, uh, you know, call, and she's got it on a tape recorder. And so she goes out, and plays this, and of course the bird comes in. She takes lots of photographs, and then Eric Roberts turns up. So parachutes in. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. So she takes more takes photographs of him, and he's like takes the film out you can't, can't photograph me i'm like wow you're a right prima donna aren't you mate <laughs> you know strutting around you know eyeing up the lady and all this stuff and you don't want your photograph taken and uh and then as an apology he goes and shows her where the nest is yeah. so she can get more photographs and then uh i don't know then she gets really horny and they have sex up there it was kind of like it was, I mean, again, I don't know whether this was sort of typical of this sort of film in the era, but they had like these kind of, you know, quite long, quite graphic, over the top sex scenes with like yes. lots of, lots of sweat. And oh, it was just kind of, and they had to show it twice because, of course, they had her fantasizing about it the following day or whatever in a hotel room. And it was just <laughs> oh, kind of like, I, I, you know, I was watching it on my own, and I almost felt kind of uncomfortable <laughs> watching it. It was like, you know, <laughs> oh, I was, I was wondering, is uh, when it was sort of all that sex, I went, wait a minute, this, this feels like I'm watching a soft porn. Film. But it was like an Andy Sardius type film, wasn't it, or whatever? <laughs> it was like, well, this is the thing, because up to this point, nothing's really happened. It, it has that kind of soft core porn feel to it you know woman she's sent out on a photography uh mission to you know to africa and you know she's on her own she meets this hunk of a guy in, in the and they fall in love immediately and have lots of hot sweaty sex and you think wow that is a soft porn setup but then then it gets weird yeah it does it gets very weird yeah and, it feels uh, a bit odd it, it didn't seem to yeah. quite gel right and then of course you have this sort of scene where she there's this there's this weird albino character that's that's at the same hotel as her and eric roberts and um 
uh, she gets drugged and passes out for a little while, doesn't she? And then she ret- she she gets a flight and returns to London. Um, yeah. And uh, you, you know, all of a sudden, customs and excise come in and and sort of go through ho- all of her belongings and confiscate her passport. And that's when we get into this sort of Interpol. Um, plot that uh, Eric Roberts is in fact not just a sort of skydiver you know womanizing uh, daredevil type guy but he's actually an Interpol agent and <laughs> that, that poor woman the amount of people that came up to her and said they were from Interpol I would uh, at the end of that film I would never trust anybody <laughs> who said they were from Interpol <laughs> I mean it was, it was crazy because literally it's like every time somebody came up to her who either you know was on her side or not, uh, or said they were Interpol. Yeah, it was kind of I don't know, and and I kind of I'll, I'll be honest, I'll be honest, I, I plot wise, I kind of lost interest in this a little bit, and it was one of those things that ended up going from watching a movie just for enjoyment to this was a bit of an exercise as homework for the podcast. You know, it kind of felt a bit <laughs> yeah. like that, so. I watched it. You, yeah. I mean, you, it's interesting. You said you turned off halfway through and came back to it. I watched it kind of half-heartedly because mm. I, I did lose interest in this very quickly. Um, yeah. I don't know whether it was necessarily a a bad story, but it wasn't particularly well done. And even even the action that it promised, you know, from the from the DVD cover and whatever. It wasn't really there. It did sort of feel no. low budget action, um, erotic action flick kind of. Yeah. <laughs> it just <laughs> well, uh, right. Well, what it is is that um, everybody from Interpol <laughs> is after uh, this list that um, she has. Yes, that she doesn't know she has, right? Because of being drugged and brainwashed yeah well i mean the thing is though when eric roberts turns up in london and says he tells her straight away that she has this list this roster of uh, of agents and that the the other people from interpol uh won it yeah it's kind of like the nog list from uh mission impossible but not done as well yeah <laughs> and there's this whole bit where he takes her back to her his place and it's you know one of these sort of a penthouse top of a warehouse kind of deal and you know it's it's very barren there's nothing really there but a cage and this weird thing where i thought she, he was gonna lock her up or something and then he doesn't and i'm like i am get confused here but so a lot of bad guys in ski masks turn up and start attacking them and of course he's got the place all rigged to blow and so they run out and you know he shoots a few people and was that weird bit when he flushes the toilet I'm like what the yeah, fuck yeah <laughs> what's that got to do with escaping and blowing the place up okay and he's got this um escape route set up where they jump and fall through a, a pane of glass and then land in an airbag and when they come out of it they're like wow this is great and she's like i want to do that again and all stuff uh unfortunately the bad guys had spotted this and they were waiting for <laughs> was just like oh damn dope <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you know i was thinking you know may i was just trying to be sort of objective about it when i was watching it and i thought i don't know if i if i'd watched this at the time would i have just thought it was yeah it was okay you know would, would it would it have been something that i was would have thought was all right at the time and is it just that it hasn't held up um yeah, you know, I mean, well, I, I, I think, don't know whether it's necessarily think, badly made. I think, you know, to say he didn't make it well, I, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know. Of... This, this, I, I feel like the story is a, it's, it's just one of those stories. that's really incompetently told. It, it's this, this, I don't know. I, I, it just feels like there was a lot of problems that happened. Yeah. And things that they thought they could fix at the time, and they couldn't. And I don't quite know what Jeff Fahey was doing in this film. It seemed a very odd role for him. 
he seems somewhat miscast and yeah but i mean this is also the time when he was doing a lot of director video stuff yeah i mean I, he, his big break was lawnmower man oh, and this yes. comes afterwards yeah and you know he he's he's been doing a lot of straight to video stuff for most of the 90s and this is sort of this is one of them and um yeah i mean again his character was a bit because you know so at the beginning he's this owner of a magazine and he sends his fiance out and then he proposes it yeah yes and then he's out and he meets her in london and um he gets shot and you think oh okay all right that's a bit of a waste of him but you've got this sort of nagging feeling he's going to come back so when they um they they grab them both and then I think they take them back to Africa. Yeah, I mean, I I, I remember I I got pulled out of the movie and a bit confused at one point because I think it ended up making sense, but it just pulled me out was when suddenly there are in London, you know, um, at, yeah. at the time there there's these you know normal sort of police bobby type well not bobbies but police guys that are armed and i'm thinking well hold on this was made by a, a brit he should know better than this you know but then it turns out that they weren't real police anyway they were they were agents as well so it sort of made sense they were interpol but it, agents but it, but, it, but, it, but it, it pulled me out of the movie for a minute because i sort of thought well that's not very realistic you know and then... no and and jeff fahey turning up at the end as the villain it was kind of like Ugh, oh, okay. yeah grown yeah grown and 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 then you have this whole thing so uh the she's been kind of hypnotized into the list and uh jeff faye knows how to uh hypnotize her to get it back <laughs> of course and so he's of course yeah uh using some sort of african method and all this stuff yeah you know and then eric roberts saves her and, and there's one more final gunfight where uh oh yeah the jeff, jeff Fay um gets thrown off the side of the cliff, doesn't he? He does, yeah, yeah. Which, which, <laughs> yeah. which was like probably the highlight of the film. Yeah, yeah. I mean I'm kind of, I'm you kind go, of because you go, right, this film's ending. Now. Yeah, I'm kinda of glad you watched this too, because I think if you hadn't, I would have kind of struggled really to describe this simply because yeah. it's one of those things now I, I find if something you, you know, I don't know whether it's it's about the more stuff we see or the more we're bombarded with or what. But if something if something doesn't really grab my attention too well, I forget it rather quickly. And yeah, um, yeah I think I've I've forgotten most of this movie already because it really didn't make much of an impact no, with me. No, and I didn't. thought this is definitely the right choice for movie hell. Um. <laughs> oh, definitely. I, I, I will state this now. This is the worst film I've seen for this podcast. It's really fucking awful. Yeah, uh, but yet people like it. That was that was the thing. Oh, if you're really into action, you'll love this. Yeah, film. I mean, it, it. I was like, the action was. Uh, it was yeah. It was just. I've seen it, wasn't, it, better, it wasn't... I've seen it better done. I mean, the whole the the whole sequence where they're in his place and it's going to blow up was done better in Enemy of the State. Yes, which was a very similar scene, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, but um, no, it was just kind of it, you know, it, it's very forgettable. Um, I'm glad I didn't spend more than one pound twenty or whatever on it. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't spend any money. I, on I, it. I, you know, and it's not something I want taking up space in my uh, in my DVD rack. Really, you know, when 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 space is of of, of the essence. So it will uh, it will probably get donated to some sort of charity shop or something somewhere down the line um, very soon. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, again, I've not been able to find out any information about this in terms of you know interviews with John Irvin or anything like that. But you you know, this to me felt like a step back, uh, a step backwards oh. for him very much. Yes, and very much. It's so. very of the time, but it doesn't hold up at all. I don't think. And and you know, it had this awful cheesy ending where they get back yes. together and she's 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 with interpol and i i guess we assume this is the real interpol now and not the pretend yes. one that kept turning up and um she's they're like right so you're off to this place and uh unfortunately eric roberts character is not available because he's off on another mission yeah uh but um 
yes, we've got somebody to drive you to the airport. And then, of course, it's of course it's Eric Roberts. Yeah, dressed very like he's got his little trilby hat on, and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, again, yeah. it's very 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 of the era, which is fair enough. I mean, films are in their era; that's fine. But uh, it, it it was all very cheesy, and um, yes. You know, yeah. barely even B movie. I'd always put it as like a C movie. <laughs> I would say it was Z movie. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a great film. And yeah, you know, I think we've we've probably already given it more airtime than it deserves. Really. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, if you want to watch a really bad film, uh, then then check this out. You know, uh, I I know of, of a copy going. If you want it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So send your send send your donations to. <laughs> I tell you what, if if one of the listeners actually wants it, I'm sure um, Keith will give it to you. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'd be delighted to know that we have a listener for for start, for starters. <laughs> so that would be amazing. Uh, but yeah, so if you give him the copy of that film, we might lose it. Yeah, that's true. That, yeah, exactly. After this, I mean, you know, they haven't already tuned out. This is it now. But um, yeah, yeah. so uh, y- you know, John Irwin, nothing against you, mate, but this this uh, this particular film is and nothing against any of the actors in it either. But the film is not very good. <laughs> some yeah. nice some nice aerial photography shots, and and that's about the only good thing I can say about it. Really, that's it, and. Just remember, if somebody comes up to you and says they're an Interpol agent, <laughs> run. <laughs> Indeed, run. <laughs> far, far okay. away. Right. Right. Let's let's go on to something that's a lot better, but is my choice for uh, movie hell. And um, as we said at the beginning, John Irvin was a documentary filmmaker and uh, he shot a lot of footage over in Vietnam. And so... Um, he made a, a feature film in the 80s, uh, 87, uh, called Hamburger Hill. And uh, yes, um, and this is my pick for uh, Movie Hell. It, it's it's funny that it came out the same year when we got Platoon and Full Metal Jacket. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a bit like we were talking about earlier. Um, you, you know, I, I guess enough time had passed since the uh, the Vietnam War that, that, that Hollywood were happy to make films about it and i mean yes you had platoon and you had full metal jacket you had this film obviously we talked about on the uh de palma one you had casualties of war you you know but that was two years later yes there was not it's not the same year but um but yeah so um hamburger hill now it's uh, a film that follows a, a platoon of men who um take on this battle for this hill uh, and supposedly it's one of the bloodiest battles in Vietnam. Yeah, it was May 1969, wasn't it? This takes place in, and it was the uh, yeah the taking of that hill that uh, that they they named Hamburger Hill because of all the um, all the devastation and mutilation that that, uh, that 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 took place trying to take it. Well, I, I mean, so we get to meet these troops i mean they're a combination of new troops and seasoned veterans and you know the my my first problem was that the characters in it weren't very well defined apart from one or two but they were re- but then they were super defined and so it was really hard to tell who was who and to care for when they got killed because this it is one of these films where you're getting to, you, you the idea is you set these guys up. You say, right, these are the people we're going to follow. Here's their story. This is what they do. And then as the film goes along, we're going to see who gets picked off and who survives. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this this was this was very early career films for Don Cheadle, Dylan McDermott, Courtney B. Vance and Stephen Weber, which have obviously gone mm-hmm. on right up to this day to have success in both films and and television uh, series um so this this was very early on in fact a couple of them i think it may have been their first main 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 feature that's right but i mean don cheadle did colors around the same time as well right okay yeah fair enough and i was watching that recently and uh he plays a character that's very similar to the character he plays in in outside right 
But uh, yes, he was in this and he was very good. But again, his character wasn't just very well defined. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those ones. I definitely remember the poster in the video library, mm. um, even though I had seen, obviously, Platoon and Full Metal Jacket. Um, I hadn't actually seen this film before. So this, the, the, you know, I, I watched it for the first time as part of this, um, you know, research for this particular podcast. And, you know, I wouldn't have picked it as movie hell, but uh, I'm interested to hear you say more about why you have, actually. Well, the, the thing was, I had seen it um, back in the 90s and I could not remember a thing about it. And so, yeah, going back to me, it felt like watching it for the first time. Now, the, the problem is, again, as I say, with setup, you don't really, the characters aren't that well defined. So you can't really tell who is who. I mean, if we take Platoon, you know who Charlie Sheen's character is. He's the new recruit who's bright eyed and naive. And you take um, old, uh, Tom Barringer's character he's the grizzled sergeant mm -hmm. you know he's he's the tough one and then you and then you go through the list of of the actors and the characters they play and you remember them they're, they're very well defined characters with these with this film they, they all seem to be kind of a blur i mean not uh, even casualties of war you could tell who each character was they all had like a defining um element about each of them but in this film, it, they they just sort of blurred into each other. And the other problem was was that every time a soldier got killed or injured, it was off screen. So you would always sort of see the aftermath. There wasn't many times when you actually saw one of the characters actually get killed on camera. Yeah, it's like um, at the beginning, uh, they're on top of their hill, their their base. And they're looking down on this river and there's like the girls sort of doing the washing there and they're all perving over them. And then suddenly artillery comes in. You start seeing these explosions. And they they actually do like a, a bombing mission onto it to destroy the tree line. And of course, one of the guys has actually been hit by the enemy artillery. artillery no, fucking hell, I can't say that. Artillery, yeah. But, <laughs> artillery, thank you. <laughs> uh, but again, you, it's like aftermath. You Now it's kind of like an interesting idea that to, to do that. But then because I didn't know who that character really was, it didn't affect me. And it just carried on out throughout the film because they keep with the, with the battle, because it takes place over such a long time. They have, so you, you have some fighting and they stop and then they have some fighting and they have, but there's never sort of any, you, you just, you're not quite sure where you are and, and stuff. And, but not in a good way. You know, you, you could I could see this like if it was done well, it, it, it could have kind of worked at higher. The idea of putting yourself in the shoes of these soldiers so that you were never quite sure what was going on and what was happening. And, you know, one day bleeding to another, but it just does not work in this film. And it was, uh, you know, I, I went back to watch this and this wasn't originally going to be my, my pick for movie hell. I originally, I was going to pick Robin Hood, but I actually enjoyed Robin Hood. I thought <laughs> Robin Hood was really well done with this. I was just, I, it just felt like a mess, you know, it really felt like a mess, but, uh, but the problem was, it's just, it, it didn't quite work, you know, and what surprised me even more because of John Irvin's background of, of being actually there with the grunts on the ground, you think he would have a better perspective. He would have the same kind of perspective that Oliver Stone had when he made Platoon. And he didn't. It did feel like it was somebody who came from that from the outside and went, ooh, you know, Vietnam War films. Ooh, this is, you know, because they have the same tropes where you have the music, you know, you have all the, the songs playing. and But it just... The, the battles, there was no kind of stakes. They happen very quickly, and then you find out some soldiers have died. And you might see them, or you might not. I mean, when the doc gets killed, you didn't even realise he'd been shot. He suddenly just, you know, he's there talking about, oh, I'm going to get out of here, and, you know, and you think, oh, wow, you know, good for him, and then he just dies. And then, you know, uh, the main guy sort of has a cry over it, and you're just like, okay. 
<laughs> it's just, I don't know, it just didn't work. Okay. Yeah, I mean, y- you know, um, I know, I mean, I know this, this was written by a, a Vietnam vet. Uh, obviously, as you, as you said, um, uh, John Irvin, uh, you know, did some documentary in, you know, during Vietnam out there. Um, and even though it was shot in the Philippines, they had a, um, uh, a Vietnamese advisor and whatever, you, you know, present during this. Uh, I mean, I, I, obviously, I tried to do a bit of digging as well to find out a bit about the production. Uh, you said about, yeah. you, know, you know, his interviews are fairly rare. I, I did actually find I got the um, I got the 20th anniversary DVD edition. I decided not to get the Blu-ray because the extras were the same. And I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to pick it up cheaper. Um, yeah. And there is a couple of uh, couple of featurettes, uh, retrospective featurettes on there. Um, so there is a little bit of, of of Irvin talking about the film and 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 you know some of the actors you know who who by then were famous but weren't at the time. But the trouble is with a lot of these, whether they're EPKs or, or retrospectives or whatever. They, they all end up being a little bit sort of sycophantic and, you know, everybody's great and all this sort of thing, you know. <laughs> um, but interesting enough, I mean, th- th- this actual production, again, was 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 plagued by uh, tragedy in, in, in so much as a, an electrician that worked on this was actually um, uh, killed, um, electrocuted, like, during the, the, oh, the, the first week of shooting or something, which... Uh, Oh, wow. So I mean, you, you know, they're they're making this um, film about this this horrendous battle that took place, you know, during the Vietnam War as it was, but also, you, you know, whilst that was going on, they actually lost someone, you, you know, on the film production as well. So I mean, it, it, you know, it's it's uh, that that was that was quite upsetting to hear because you, you know we all say you know even though even though we kind of live for filmmaking you know the important thing is nobody gets hurt or worse you know during That's during right, a, yeah. a shoot so um you, you, you know it sounds like it had had some some problems in terms of the actual uh production and some of the things they had to deal with um but it also said and again they had some interviews on this that because nobody else had done a a film about this particular battle um from a veteran's point of view it was actually very very well received because they you know they felt it had been quite respectful and whatever to that um you know i, I i'll be honest i i didn't i didn't mind it i i watched it i mean you know i always find any films about war hard to watch it, you know because they're, they're supposed to be to a certain extent um you, you you know it doesn't of course it doesn't have the gravitas of of what stone and and kubrick did with 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 their films um and it, again it, it it might have suffered a little bit at that timing thing again kind of like what we were talking about earlier about how this was made at the same time as those those other two films that that uh, obviously got released and and received you know critical acclaim and War awards and things of that nature but true um, but i mean it's as a film on its own it just doesn't really stand out very well yeah you know because the the thing is um platoon and full metal jacket even though they take place in the same war are very two different beasts oh very much so yes yeah. well, i mean i mean i mean full metal jackets two films in one for a start isn't it so yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it is about I mean, it is about dehumanizing, you know, people, even more so with the Cubic version. You know, war is hell, you know, people die. But the thing is about those two films is the characters. You remember the characters, you remember Joker, you remember Tex, you remember, you know, um, Charlie Sheen's character, you remember Tom Berenger, you remember William Defoe, you remember those guys. Name me a character from this film. Yeah, I mean, the only one that springs to mind is Doc, for obvious reasons. Yeah. We were just talking about yeah. him, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I take your point. I, I, I think it will be a film that um, 
you know, for me now will be quite forgettable, meaning even though I quite enjoyed it and, and I didn't think yeah. it was badly made or anything like that. I mean, it's so, you know, in terms of production value and stuff, it's, it's, it's a decent, decent film. It's, it's quite nicely, you know, shot and constructed, but yeah, will it, will it stay in my memory? Yeah, probably not. So I see what you yeah. mean. Yeah. In terms of that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it's a shame. I mean, it, I'm, you know, the poster for it was quite evocative. I remember it, the guy standing on top of the hill with red background and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Hamburger Hill is a great title. I mean, it's like, it, you know, it's like Chainsaw Massacre. You, you, you know, it's kind of like ground up meat kind of thing, mm-hmm. but it just doesn't have that sort of kind of, you know, that memorable quality about it. There's nothing that memorable about it. I think the only thing, scene I can really bring remember is the bit when they're all brushing their teeth. Yeah, which I thought was actually, in terms of a character thing, that was a, a, a nice scene. I did like that, actually, you know, and the importance of, uh, y- y- you know, when, when out in the jungle, you know, oral hygiene being, you know, uh, of paramount importance and all that. But, yeah, I, that, that's... That's a memorable scene in it, definitely. But um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Tonight, I'm finding it. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know whether I've just knackered from a, a, a particularly busy week <laughs> or whatever. But unusually, and and uh, you know, Mike would say this is a surprise. Um, I, I, I'm actually <laughs> finding it quite hard to, to to add anything really at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I thought it was a decent film. I remember one bit in it that was really quite, um, in terms of being graphic, uh, yeah. and it just sort of, it almost felt like a bit out of place compared to the rest of it, is when one of them grabs an M60 and basically blows this Viet Cong guy's head to smithereens. Do you remember that? Oh, they actually, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do remember that. They actually show the head blow up, and I was like, bloody hell, you know. Um, yeah, it just it, it did. It kind of came out the blue. Yeah. And, but there was, at, before and after that, there was never anything quite like that. I mean, you saw the aftermath of stuff, but not to that extent. Something that's quite interesting based on what you've said, and, you know, I, obviously I, I take that in and see whether I sort of agree or, 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 or understand your point, and obviously i'm i'm watching it now knowing you know the career of like dylan mcdermott steve weber courtney b vance john don cheadle and whatever you know so i know them yeah and so i'm yeah. looking at these thinking oh look don't they, they look young there my god you know that was it but if if i'd watched this at the time um you know i got it on vhs or whatever and watched it when it came out um I don't know. Did it get a theatrical release? I, I assume it did. No, no, I don't remember it being okay. released theatrically. I just remember it being in video shops. Right, fair enough. But would 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 those characters have have stayed in my head then? Yeah, quite possibly not. Actually, that's a really good point. I mean, I'm I'm watching it, sort of knowing who they are now, if that makes sense, and saying, "Oh, wow, this yeah. is how they got started." Yeah, take that away. If it was, if it say, if it, if it was a a foreign film and I didn't know any of the actors in it, which is one of one of the things I quite like about watching foreign films. Sometimes is you you've no idea where it's going to go because you know you, you you don't know. Oh, that's the Tom Cruise guy who's going to live, you know, and all this <laughs> shit. So, um, but yeah, uh, had I watched it that way, yeah, would anyone have been particularly memorable? Probably, probably the Doc character. You know, he. Because and and largely because of that scene you you mentioned with the um uh the, the teeth cleaning scene the oral hygiene scene yeah and the fact that he was very highly emotionally you know he he, he just was very sort of ott yes and I've actually read that this else. was indeed Courtney B Vance's first film so right so yeah so not a bad performance from from him no, there, I it, guess, it wasn't but... it was just it. it why it was a standout is because he was the only one who was kind of doing that kind of over the top acting, you know, in a way it was just, everything was always tuned, turned up to 11. So he was very emotional or he's very angry or he's, you know, 
and, and that's kind of like why it stand out because everybody else was a bit more you know laid back i guess or you know just a bit more subdued hmm. yeah no i i take your point there i mean in terms of let's let's look at you know the 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 topic in hand you know the the, the films of john irvin i mean you, you know this this one i think is a is a uh, you know it has quite an epic feel it's quite a quite a well made film i would say i mean they 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 said in in you know in the documentaries as they do in this that he he was like quite literally the military commander you know on mm. on set and looked after because obviously he was quite a bit older than these actors were at the time on this so he, he was kind of the one looking after them and and guiding them which you know as a director you should do absolutely but um yeah is it stand out yeah probably not actually i mean i mean this is the thing i think you know in sort of conclusion to the whole movie heaven movie hell john irvin edition is that's the thing he's one of those directors that that you know in terms of a craftsman in terms of uh, uh, of a director you know is competent and doesn't really do anything wrong as such but are his movies definable in any way and are they anything that we'll remember i mean no he's been doing it a long time he's still doing it but um yeah it's not one of those people that instantly spring to mind and, and like you said when you were looking for i there, there weren't many directors with the no. With the letter I and 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 would he have necessarily been someone you may have picked if there were more? Possibly not. I don't know. Well, I I think I would have just because I have such a, a fondness for Raw Deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's a great. I mean, that, film. That's a film from you know my teenage years. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, it still has a place in my heart, and I enjoyed going back and watching it. So I, I would have. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Mean, when I, I it was recommended it. to me. I was like, oh yeah, bloody raw deal. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I enjoyed it. Again, it was a it was a film that I'd always had. It had always been there, but um, you know, hadn't visited for for a long while. And um uh you know that was very enjoyable. But we've definitely got a contrast. I mean, you look mm. at Raw Deal, which I think we're both in total agreement with um is a great film. Uh, you know, Hamburger Hill, may, maybe we're slightly divided on that one. Um, Ghost Story, you know, again, we said that that was quite a good film. But then completely the other end of the spectrum, you've got something like Freefall and, uh, you know, which was made after those films, which is which is the bizarre yeah. thing. And uh, and I never saw. But you said this film he did in the early noughties uh, with Michael Caine was pretty awful was it uh i haven't seen oh, okay. it i Sorry. just it, maybe it was yeah someone else i don't know if it was awful that. or not i think i think but speaking to someone yeah, i heard it wasn't very good okay yeah. and uh yeah, yeah they, they, they the per i can't remember who it was i was speaking to actually about it but um they they, they said it was a pretty pants film apparently so yeah yeah i i i knew it was something that i didn't want to sort of go out and you know watch yeah Maybe, maybe, maybe he's another one like some of the others we took, which not quite to the same extent of the others, but but sort of had a had a high point in his career and um, has lost it. I mean, it's interesting. This guy came from TV into feature world, but unlike a lot of them, hasn't gone back to television because you look at a lot of um, you know feature directors now, and they've all they've all sort of like we've talked about in other podcasts, they've all kind of gone to this new age of, of of television that we have now and um from looking at it john irvin is still making feature films and i'm guessing these are things that are going straight to pay-per-view or, or um dvd or whatever you know i think so i mean he's i'm just looking at his imdb page and uh, he's currently got a film in post-production called mandela's gun Oh right, okay. Yeah, which is it's due out for twenty fifteen this year. Uh, unfortunately, no synopsis. All oh, right, no idea who's in it, and yeah, the actors I haven't heard any of them. So mm. yeah. Well, hey, you know he's doing what he loves. He's so. still making. Yeah, it, yeah? exactly. Seventy five yeah. or whatever yeah. now, isn't he? So um, mm. yeah, he's he's still doing what he loves, and uh, you know he's he spent his whole whole life doing it. So, yeah. 
So good you on know, something good came yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, raw, raw deal is 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 a little gem, and 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 actually, I have to say, you know, for anyone who who's listening that wants to check something out, I hadn't seen Ghost Story, and uh, yeah, for for discovering something new from the past, um, that was a pretty good find. I would I would yeah. I would go as far to say. Indeed. Yes. Right, Keith. So. How can people find you? Right. Uh, if you go to YouTube and go to British Isles, spelled E-Y-L-E-S, as in my surname, um, you'll find uh, short films that I've made to date on there uh, and information of how to contact further from there. And I believe there's a link on the attached to this podcast. There is indeed. So you can find me at independentrunnings.com. And I also have a YouTube channel, which is Independent Runnings. Uh, also, you can follow the podcast on Facebook at Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. And we also have a Twitter page, which is at Movie Heaven Hell. There you go. All one word. And we, we, we've still been feature length, although not as long as some of our uh, feature length commentaries. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we've given him his due, haven't we, I think? We have indeed. We have indeed. And, yeah, you know, we, we all sort of around the, you know, one and a half hour to two hour mark we haven't gone over two hours yet no yet (laughs) (laughs) well thank you for listening and uh, be sure to check out the next podcast thank you very much